Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Let's begin with a troubling development. Yesterday, Tuesday, a suicide bomber rammed a vehicle into a convoy of Chinese engineers working on a dam project in northwest Pakistan, killing six people. The five Chinese engineers were en route from Islamabad to their camp at the dam construction site. Their Pakistani driver was also killed. That area has been attacked in the past. A bombing of a bus killed 13 people, including nine Chinese nationals, in 2021. No one claimed responsibility for Tuesday's attack. It's unclear whether it could have been an Islamic group or ethnic militants seeking secession. The latter operate more in the south, whereas the former operate in the north, where this attack took place. The attack highlights the increasing security challenges China faces in countries such as Pakistan, as China has sought to extend its influence. Globally, Chinese workers in Asia and Africa have come under attack. Incredibly, this Tuesday attack is the third major attack on Chinese interests in Pakistan in a week. The first two attacks targeted a Pakistani naval air base and a strategic port used by China in the southwest of the country, where China is investing billions in infrastructure projects as part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, a key strategic element for Beijing and part of the wider Belt and Road Initiative. This southwestern province has a history of separatist activity. In 2022, a Pakistani woman blew herself up outside the gate of a Karachi University Chinese language institute, killing three Chinese teachers and a Pakistani driver. Pakistan has seen its overall security situation deteriorate sharply since the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan in 2021. Of course, Beijing is not pleased with any of this, and this is fast becoming a political issue for them. Yesterday, China's embassy in Pakistan expressed, "Quote: The Chinese embassy and consulates in Pakistan have." A Immediately launched emergency work, demanding that the Pakistani side conduct a thorough investigation into the attack, severely punish the perpetrators, and take practical and effective measures to protect the safety of Chinese citizens. End quote. The security of thousands of Chinese workers has become a sensitive issue in Pakistan. Pakistan's poor financial situation means it relies heavily on China, and Islamabad has dedicated thousands of soldiers to protecting Chinese projects and personnel. In the past, Beijing has offered sending security personnel into the region, an offer that Pakistan has so far rebuffed. However, if these attacks continue to occur, Beijing may force the issue. Such a move may create more problems than it solves for China. However, pulling the country further into a potential quagmire, it would also trigger greater concern from India. Next up, we move to the economy, and according to official numbers published by the National Bureau of Statistics today, Wednesday, China's industrial profits returned to growth at the start of the year. If accurate, this is a positive sign. According to the official numbers, industrial profits jumped 10.2 percent in the first two months of 2024, compared with a 2.3 percent decline for all of 2023. The result was partially thanks to a low base last year. China's state-owned companies reported a 0.5% rise in profits in January and February, while profits at foreign companies jumped 31.2%. Private companies saw growth of 12.7 percent. Profits in China's manufacturing sector expanded 17.4 percent in the first two months of the year. The mining sector was the main drag on overall profit growth, seeing its profits drop 21.2 percent in the same period. Equipment manufacturing recorded a 28.9 percent expansion from a year ago. U.S.-based Bloomberg writes that the increase in industrial profits quote provided more evidence that the world's second-largest economy is on a firmer footing this year, on the back of rebounding foreign demand and policy stimulus by Beijing. Still, deflationary pressure lingers as a property slump and subdued confidence weigh on domestic demand, with falling factory gate prices squeezing industrial firms' profit margins. End quote. Bloomberg economist Eric Zhu added, quote, "The data echoed some green shots in manufacturing production in the first two months of 2024. Going forward, the fragile economy and sustained deflation mean a more solid recovery in profits." A prerequisite for companies to expand investment and hiring will probably hinge on the degree of policy support. Next up, China's Middle East 
policy. If you're enjoying today's episode of China Update or getting some value from it, it's a huge help if you can hit the like button. Subscribing is also a huge help. 45% of regular viewers are currently not subscribed. This is the only way in which the channel can grow. And Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description for those who want to help me keep the channel financially sustainable. I rely primarily on this support to keep the channel going. As always, thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. Next up, we cover China's developing policy approach to an increasingly unstable Middle East region. In a brief statement last week, China's foreign ministry said foreign ministry envoy Wang Kejian met with a senior political leader of Hamas in Qatar and, quote, exchanged views on the Gaza conflict and other issues, end quote, without further elaboration. Last week, too, news broke that the Yemen-based Houthis had told China and Russia their ships can sail through the Red Sea without being attacked. China and Russia reached an understanding following talks between their diplomats in Oman and Mohammed Abdul Salam, one of the Houthis' top political figures. In exchange, it was reported, the two countries may provide political support to the Houthis in bodies such as the United Nations Security Council. Many Western merchant ships have been forced to take the longer route around Africa instead of the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, adding days and significant freight costs onto journeys. Some commentators were quick to point out that negotiating private access agreements while allowing highly disruptive attacks to continue may undermine China's global charm offensive that it can offer an alternative global order which seeks a greater place for the global south. Then on the weekend, Saturday, the Houthis fired four missiles into the vicinity of a Chinese-owned oil carrier called the Huangpu, then fired a fourth toward the ship soon after. It caused some damage and a fire on board was extinguished within half an hour. It's unclear what happened. Did the Houthis renege on the agreement? Is this just a breakdown of authority with some fighters acting independently, or was it all just a mistake? Daniel Byman, a senior fellow at the Washington, D.C. think tank CSIS, said it's possible that the Houthis hit the Chinese ship on purpose, but that the incident was, quote, more likely to be an intelligence failure on the Houthis' part, where they did not know or incorrectly identify the ownership of the ship. They have made identification mistakes before. End quote. In late January, missiles exploded near a ship hauling Russian oil near Yemen, just days after a spokesman for the Houthis told a Russian newspaper that Russian and Chinese merchant ships needn't fear attacks. Andreas Craig, CEO of MENA Analytica, a London-based strategic risk consultancy firm focusing on the wider Middle East, warns that even if it was an accident, the Houthis are, quote, risking to escalate this issue beyond their quarrel with Israel and the West. Drawing in China would be a mistake, as China is already in close conversation with Iran over Houthi attacks. It could expose Iran to Chinese pressure, and Beijing will not tolerate these attacks on the arteries of trade which for China is the backbone of its economic great power posture, end quote. He added that this incident, quote, shows how dangerous it is to equip a networked actor such as the Houthis with such capability. The consequences for regional security are problematic. The Houthis are not an actor that can be trusted with such an activity. End quote. Meanwhile, over the weekend, Russia and China vetoed the strongest move yet by the U.S. to pressure Israel at the United Nations Security Council, saying that a resolution endorsing a ceasefire in Gaza was still too weak. The proposal cited, quote, the imperative of an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza, but did not demand one. The U.S. resolution also included a condemnation of the October 7th attack on Israel by Hamas. Most U.S. proposals by other nations left out criticism of Hamas, which is designated a terrorist organization by the U.S. and European Union. Eleven out of the 15 Security Council members voted in favor of the resolution. Russia and the Chinese vetoed it. After the vote, U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield told the council, quote, Let's be honest. For all the fiery rhetoric, we all know that Russia and China are not doing anything diplomatically to advance a lasting peace or to meaningfully contribute to the humanitarian response. End quote. Chinese Ambassador Zhang Jun criticized the proposal's failure to flatly oppose an invasion of Rafa. Quote, the draft does not clearly and equivocally state its opposition, which would send a totally wrong signal and lead to severe consequences. End quote. 
Then on Monday, China said it supports a new draft resolution at the UN Security Council on an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Lin Dian expressed, quote, China supports this draft resolution. We hope the Security Council will pass it as soon as possible and send a strong signal for the cessation of hostilities, end quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a good Wednesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.